there, so my internet was not working, so sorry to disappoint you guys all out there who were ready to watch my live workshop on Clay Buddies, um, but I'm going to try and do a condensed version because I'm taking video on my phone, and who knows how long I have uh, space in my phone to have video, so let me just jump right into this. My workshop is on bud bases, and I thought this was a really relevant topic because I don't know if you've seen, but um, I'm Lisa York and I just had uh, my article out in Ceramics Monthly where I talk about forms that are helpful to have when loading a wood kiln and I kind of break it into four categories of things that are great to bring with you to load into a wood kiln. Tiny objects, bud bases are tiny. Complementary shapes, oh yeah, bud bases go around any bowl. And then tall and thin, yep, meets that category too. <laughs> The only category this doesn't really fulfill is, I say, like special topic things. So, for instance, I just started making these vases rather than using a crown. Um, I literally, here, let me hold it up a little bit closer, but I'm literally using this vase in lieu of a crown. So, um, crown, you don't know what that is. Essentially, I'm wadding or placing a bowl upside down on top of this vase. So, yeah, that's why I chose the bud vase because it's really relevant. So if you're curious about things to make and bring to whatever wood farm you're going to, take a look at this article on Ceramics Monthly. Um, but really, let me jump into the idea of a clay assignment. Get this so the light's better. Um, so I have a bud vase assignment. So, I mean, this could be those of you who are normally in a classroom setting being told what to do, or those of you like me in the studio and kind of bummed out about the world right now and just need something to just do and make and not have to think about it. So I have um, described here three different profiles. So we got straight flare. If it flared the other way, it'd be a gum, in my opinion. Um, convex, concave, and then you can change it up with the foot. So I tend to make non-round forms. Um, so let's see here. I got three, three different shapes here. So I've got triangular, square, rectangle. Um, I love these pair of bottles here. And then um, in addition to that, um, different foot statements. So here, I'll grab a couple more. Um, here's like a carved, whoops, don't need the price sign there. Here's like a carved foot and here is um, just a beveled foot. So, I'm going to jump into throwing some pieces for you now. And so I'm going to set these aside. And um, I am going to be working through this straight edge, um, convex, concave. You may have mixed those two up. Don't mind me. Um, so let me get my clay here. Ready? Um, so I always start. Oh, by the way, I'm working at a standing wheel. Um, I found that that helped reduce um, back pain because I position versus like being hunched over a wheel you know you can always be like oh bend at the hips but that's like you always get tired and start slouching so I find it's easier to have good posture at a standing wheel I've really been happy with that switch um, I usually use like a stress mat um, people have those usually at their kitchen sink I lost mine in the move I still need to buy a new one but usually I do that to help my feet with the extra time on my um, feet <laughs> um, so I always start with slap centering that that also gets it stuck to the wheel head. I'll get a little bit of water. If you notice as well, um, I don't usually use a splash pan. My goal is to use as little water as possible. Now, because I am talking and working, I'll probably splash more clay than I normally do. Um, so for centering, I use this palm here, and then I'm tucking below. So the palm catches the top and the side, and this catches. Um, the opposite side of the clay so it's kind of like a motion there um, and I can almost do it in one move because this is a tiny little piece of clay so catching the top and I'm moving the clay into it and then I make sure that this is going to a point and I tuck again and so yeah I typically don't really cone on the wheel now with that said I cone on the wheel if I have replanted my clay poorly or if I have um, not wedged very well, so I'm feeling lazy, then I might comb to get out to like even out the clay that might be like 
harder to spot in the clock or in others. Um, so now I'm going to open up the piece. Oh, I'm, I'm making squash bud bases. So the fun part will be when this piece is done being made. <laughs> and they'll get nearly all turned on the wheel. Um, so I'm going to leave a slightly thicker bottom. I have about one pound of clay here. And um, this is B-Mix. I actually don't normally throw with B-Mix. I usually throw with a white stoneware and stoneware. Oh, and I also actually want to not have this indent. Um, and I'll explain that more later. So I'm actually sending some clay back down to the bottom because I'm usually so good at keeping that clay tucked in. Um, but many of you are probably like me where I was like almost running out of clay. I was like, oh snap! We're going to be going in quarantine, and we just got the notification today that we're, we're required to stay at home in Wisconsin. Um, I haven't looked up all the rules of when you're allowed to leave yet, but I'm glad I got clay. And so they were out of stoneware. Um, as you can see, no real clay on the wheel head here. Um, so, yeah, I took a real dig there. So I'm sending clay back down to the bottom. And then I wanted to flare in for this shape. Um, so collaring, I usually start. I usually start at the top, kind of get the top set to going in, and then I'll come down lower. And I'm kind of focusing on touching everything mostly in two spots. So that's pretty much thrown. Um, if you have ever watched me make videos, usually on Instagram, um, I'm just getting some of the sludge off of here, I make really plain forms, and then most of the action happens in the carving of the piece, which I guess the carving wasn't quite necessarily noticeable um, in the pieces I show you, because they're wood fired, so in that quick, <gasps> here's a pot. <laughs> You probably didn't notice the carving marks. I guess I could find my hands off here. Here's one I just finished carving. Um, so you can see it has rasp marks, um, squared rectangular foot. I carved a lift as well. So that was one that I had finished. Um, so yeah, this is a thrown piece. So I'm going to stop my wheel. Now here's the most important part. To squash the base, do not cut it off the wheel head yet. You might want a little water on your hand. And you're going to go squish, squish. And all I'm doing is this palm right here to um, make it slowly go in at the bottom. And I'm slowly going in. And then be careful of it indenting too far there. So let me <laughs> go a little bit higher. Now I could decide to leave this um, mouth perfectly round, um, but most often I um, oblong or square it with the piece. And then I typically come with my Cheryl mug, uh, Cheryl mug, Cheryl rib, because um, it has a nice nine degree angle here. And I remove some of that excess clay. So if you don't have enough clay at the bottom here, it'll just really indent and do funky things when you're squishing it. So that's the real main motive in um, not having it too tucked in, like I normally do when I'm throwing forms. So I'm just kind of squaring, rather rectangling this squashed bud base. So here we go. I'm just going to tidy this up. And like I said, I'm kind of doing a speedy version of this because I don't know how much memory I have on my phone. That's a problem as artists, right? We take too many darn pictures of beautiful things. <laughs> or our dogs, right? Lots of dog pictures. And boundary pictures. Who am I kidding? So. That's how you up there. Um, a lot of times, you can't see this because it'd be 
you don't have a top view but the foot is this way and then while I'm like shaping it the like neck twists so a lot of times I have to come back in here and kind of get these back to being straight lines so let me wipe my hands off here and I will take this off so you can see it's nice and um kind of tangled shape Closer look. So nice rectangle there. I'm gonna set this down and I'm just going down my little map of assignments. I'll take this away off. So this time I'm gonna have it indent. Maybe I'll show a triangular base. Because, like I said, you can go with different profiles. Too fast for the left eye. I'm getting excited here. Um, wee! Too fast. Alright, so you can have different profiles, you can have different shaped feet, you can have different card feet. You can do these shapes with different amounts of clay. So, really, like anytime I'm kind of exploring a new shape or a new idea, I just like run down this line of like, let me vary the overall profile. All right, now let me vary the foot. Now let me vary how I've carved the foot. So I'm always jumping around different foot statements as I showed you in some of the pieces um, at the beginning. Just getting this centered and I'm ready to go. And I'm gonna not tuck too much in the beginning. Um, so I like to a lot of times open with a sponge. I guess most of the pressure is coming from this middle finger down in. But I know many of you who are going to watch this video are well experienced in clay. So really, I guess the idea is how to switch things up. Giving yourself a basic little assignment like this is a good way to do it. So, I'm going to here more, pressing the foot. And then I'm going to send some of this clay down now. Okay. I'm my pole. And um, since this is a tiny object, my poles look a little different because, like, it's kind of constant contact. Really, it's just one pole. Whoop! All the clay's thrown. Larger forms, it takes a little more effort, especially when they're taller and your fingers get separated and whatnot. But, alright, so I'm going for the indent in. So, I can make this a hair thinner. double check that there's no water that needs to be sponged up, which I don't have any water that needs to be sponged up, but you want to do that before you close this up. Alright, so now I'm going to kind of determine the shape here. Um, another thing I typically throw with a mirror, so I'm using the video as a mirror right now. And the perk of having a mirror is you're not like doing this looking at the piece, you can look straight ahead. A lot of, um, when you switch to like doing pottery full time, you realize your body gets more aches and pains. Or in the, getting older would do that too. Um, so yeah, I'm always trying to be conscientious of working with straight wrists. That's why I like to center, like with the posing motion, um, rather than like cranking it center, just thinking straight wrists, and that helps. I guess that is the shape I was said I was going for. So, um, as you saw with the squishing, it's kind of nice to have this kind of like a drier skin, so it doesn't like just stick to all your hands. So, I like to end removing all that sludge. I guess the squishing might be a little harder if the piece was like. 
really watery and weak. I um, keep a fairly thick rim too. Mostly because like I like to carve it. So it gives me more options on how I can carve it. So how about this time I go for a triangular. So I'm not going to have to indent quite as much. So I'll like rotate and indent more. Squash it more. So let me get this going. Rotate again. Because I'm not wanting it to be like four sided or anything. Squash, squash, squash. And I'm really kind of putting force down and squishing. Okay, so that's looking pretty triangular down here. Now, the squishing really only works on pieces. I'm going to kind of scrape and kind of finesse the base of the triangular shape. Squishing only really works on a kind of an arrow foot. Um, if you try and like take a base like this wide and squish it, um, if you've ever seen tutorials, usually you take like a O shape and then you can squish and the board slips, or you throw a piece bottomless and attach a new bottom. Um, but it was a really fun discovery when I realized I could totally get away with squishing without doing the, the, um, cutting out the little, uh, leaf shape. <laughs> um, because, like, I can't reach my hand in there and repair that. So it was really a nice discovery. And, um, the main learning curve was realizing don't cut it off the bat head. Because the, the wheel head before you squish, because then it like buckles on itself and it really mars the bottom. Um, I'm going to show you the bottom of this one too. Because um, as you saw, it was really nice flat bottom. Now every so often I may have gotten an air bubble trapped and I'll have a minor repair to do, but for the most part it comes out really well. So here we go and then I like to have the neck of the piece um, follow the triangular or whatever shape I put on the bottom. So I will cut this one off and show you the triangular base. So I guess in some ways you kind of can't tell the shape altered that much because um, you're kind of just getting such a one-on view. But this will make it a little easier. See, haha, <laughs> didn't even look first to make sure it was a flat bottom. And then again, I have a matching triangular mouth. So let me go for the last shape here, which is going to be more of an Audi with a little bottleneck. Oh, please right here. So I'm so sorry I can't get your questions, but um, please leave me comments. I could always make another video um, to follow up with because the live video didn't work. Um, I mean, the reality is, is everyone's using the internet right now, so sorry, but here I am with a video a little bit later. It was really nice having that drawing because I'm like, oh yeah, focus. I do the same thing when I teach workshops live. I will sometimes even, oh, I can just show you real quick. I'll sometimes even, like, I'll have a ball of clay and I will, whoop, whoop, whoop. don't mind the sound effects, but I will literally sometimes draw what I'm going to throw on the ball of clay because when you're teaching, you're not used to like, talking about everything you're doing when you're just in your home studio. So that helps keep me on track. This time I made a little picture for you and that helps keep me on track. Um, so let me get this opened. And then, um, yeah, just even switching up how wide you stretch the bottom versus the neck totally changes the look of the shape. I can, I have some that I'm in the middle of carving, which, you know, I haven't run out of memory space yet, so maybe I could 
sure you're carving a piece as well while I'm at it. Besides, I don't. We did a lot of control here. Send that back in. Um, I don't have all your questions to answer, but that's okay. Like I said, you can send me your questions, and I can always pop on and make another video for you. If you do like wooden soda firing, um, I do. I have been creating these like educational series where I've been sharing a lot more specifically soda firing um, so you can check out some of those educational blog posts that I have I think the most recent one was an interview of I think it was Denise Joy and Ron Philbeck so that's kind of cool right um, I asked them a little bit about their soda fire experience, their schedules, like techie questions, and aesthetic questions. So I've been having fun sharing info. Um, I'm trying to remember it. Audi. Audi, Audi, Audi. So now I just need to call her in for, like I said, I wanted to do a little bottleneck. So let me get that going. Kind of have it set up. I'm just kind of tucking it. Um, coloring it in, and then it gets thick while it comes in. So we get a little out of control. But guess what? I sometimes cheat too. Find what I think's cheating. <laughs> Cutting off the wobbly rim. I do it sometimes. No shame in it. I try to displace. Displace send it back into the clay, but you know what, that just takes more time. Sometimes it's just faster and easier to cut that thing off. Alright, so like I said, I try and make sure everything stays thick. Now I'm going to just adjust the shape. talking too much. Get those seats wrapped up. Soften that harsh edge. Okay. Um, so I'll go back to doing just like the oblong rectangle shape. So start here, squish, squish, squish. Well, I'm also kind of like going forward and then going backward, not just 100%. And so squish, squish, squish. And then if it starts to get too far ahead, you can come up here, get the top of it to follow along. So, let me draw my hand off better. So, that's pretty squished. And then I come in with my straight edge rib, clean up that shape. And the shape gets cleaned up even more with the carving. We all should say thank you to Stacy and Play Buddies for organizing these workshops. Um, it was really awesome of them to try and find a way to get some ideas and opportunity for um, teachers to share professional artists working in their own studios with their students. This is just such a different time. I feel for all of you missing your clay buddies. <laughs> and hopefully you all got to take clay home. Just gotta clean up the dust often. Or rather try and clean up the clay before it becomes dust. 
steps. So speaking of being a professional artist, another important perk of um, making these, some people think it's a derogatory word, but you don't feel her, um, is that theoretically, your kiln filler could pay for the fuel of your firing. Because in some ways, like, you could either have that kiln filler in the kiln, or not if you didn't make it. So they're kind of like freebies in the kiln. So it's kind of nice if those freebies, where they're taking up that, like, small space that wouldn't necessarily have a piece to go there, pay for all the fuel of your kiln. So from a financial perspective, it's really wise to make some kiln filler and they can be really cool shapes. I love my little bud bases. Sure, they're kiln filler, but I love flowers and I think they're awesome. So, show this to you. So again, Ooh, flat bottom. So I'll hold up these three shapes because I put them on a board. They're in reverse order now. Whoa, oh, <laughs> can fix that. Um, so I got my little drawing here. Oh, I did reverse it. It was correct the first time. But regardless, a flared shape, convex, concave. May have mixed those two up. I should have looked it up before the video. But, um, so yeah, I still have space, so I'm going to jump into carving some, because I had some here ready to go. But you can see just how different the shapes looked when they're squashed and, um, here, let me get some examples of some of the ones I had thrown. So, like, here are some that are ready to carve. This one obviously has like slightly taller straight. This one's more flared. This one's more like a bottleneck at the top. Um, yeah, they look quite different. And I, I mean, I like having, I usually don't say, if you really wanted to repeat them all, you would measure the base of the foot and let that not change. And you'd have to know what that measure of the base is before you squish it. And then you'd have to measure the neck and then you'd have to maybe like put your hand here to know where the neck point starts if you really want to make them exact. But that's not my goal. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into carving one of these. So you can see, flat bottom. Uh -huh. And then here I'll do, I'll go to my samples here. I'll pick that foot or rather Here's the finished foot. Oh, such a great foot. I love how that ash drop built up there. So there you go. Let me go for that foot. Um, so I have this like wooden knife here. And so I will just press it. And if it's not wide enough, just take two passes. So one of the biggest perks about um, doing this, I don't know what you want to call that foot. Um, by the way, you could leave this. Sometimes I, sometimes I do. Um, I'm gonna cut it off though. <laughs> I don't always leave it. Mostly because like my surfaces and forms are more about the consistent carved surface so it's not like the freshly thrown pot where it has thrown rings and whatnot so I feel like it's more fitting for everything to be carved whereas if I were like leaving a very fresh leaving the throwing ring surface I'd probably not want to carve that away because you kind of want that look to be consistent or contrasting so mine will be contrasting in the sense that usually it's a smooth bottom. I 
don't remember what I was saying earlier. By the way, <laughs> I'm normally in bed right now. I don't know how I ended up with this wait time clock for our Facebook. Well, what was supposed to be the Facebook Clay Buddies video. But it was one that was open and so I seized the moment. Okay. So all I have done is taking my wraps. I've shaved that excess away. I kind of shaved a bevel here. Um, and an important thing to note is that if you get into this kind of carving, as I really try to reduce how much I hold the piece, because I tend to injure this hand from holding pieces while carving them. So put the piece on a surface and don't hold it when you carve it. That's why I'm always trying to tell myself. Don't injure that arm again. Because, I mean, that's a lot of imbalance exercise of just constantly holding a piece and carving it. I mean, imagine carving 20 or so pieces in a row. That's a lot of strain on that one arm. Now, if I were better about going to the gym and had a balanced set of muscle structure, maybe I could get away with it. But that is not the case. So I have to just be careful about injuring. It's actually some numbness here that actually goes back to the shoulder. Um, and I'm pretty much guaranteed that it's because I tend to want to hold the piece while I carve it. So resist the desire to hold the piece while carving. That's my words of wisdom for you if you decide to make this type of work. So I'm just smoothing things out. Um, this bottom on this particular one actually isn't that thick. So if it were thicker, by the way, did you notice that all I threw with was a sponge and my one rib? And I'll show you my vast array of carving tools. Here you go. Although I'm not even going to use this one today, so actually I'm not even going to use, well, I'm not, yeah, I'm not even going to use this one. If the foot were thicker, I would be carving the foot with this one. So really, all I have today for carving is, well I guess I used that one to impress the foot, but these two tools, rasp and my favorite stolen knife. Okay, so, and I always like to check the alignment to make sure the, the rectangles are staying, the points are staying one above the other, because like I said, sometimes they like to twist. So I'm just going to shave this. Um, typically I like the strokes of the carb line to go completely from top to bottom. You could, like I think, um, I my room blank on his name, Bill Wilkie. Wow. Always happens when you're making a video that you forget names and things. But he does his in a more like, here's a checkered pattern of how I have, um, done the rasping. So we all do things a little differently. Now if I wanted to, I could have my piece of foam here to have it set on the foam um, to get a good, because I don't want to set it on here or else it'll just squish it more. Um, so if I had a piece of foam, which I did not pull out for this, I could have it lean on that rather than holding it. Like I said, would you, don't do it. Don't hold the piece. You could injure your arm like I do on a regular basis. So I'm just doing a final pass, kind of cleaning up that mark making. Now a lot of times this mark making disappears when there's a lot of soda ash or wood ash built up on it, but every so often you can see a little hint of a texture through it, or I actually use a lot of glazes too, um, and that makes it worth doing. So also very addictive to like cheese grate your pot so it's kind of like what this is kind of like a cheese grater um it's you may not because i'm throwing the clay in here you're not noticing how much i'm shaving off but the 
seriously, sometimes I feel like I take half the weight away from the carving. So like I will throw all these pots and be like, oh snap, I used all my clay. <laughs> I reclaim it all and I can throw about almost as many pots because I shave away so much. Now, um, if this were a cup or something I was holding and I would desire to be a little more lightweight, tea bowls I like to be heavy just because of the walls of paper you can never hands so bad. So there are certain forms I like heavy, but vases tend to be more of the ones I like heavy. Every so often I'll catch myself catch it carving a vase really thin. I'm like, what are you doing? It's gonna tip over so easy. Let that vase be heavy. So I'm telling myself that right now. Let the vase be heavy. That way it's not top heavy or when you got, get a lot of flowers in it. A vase is something that you can get away with having heavier in my opinion. Um, so sometimes I will leave a rim kind of carved and cleaned up like this, but I think it's also fun to cut. Sorry, my hand's kind of in the way, isn't it? <laughs> what I've done to cuts like that. And now I will go across. so you can kind of see that soften the inside do the same thing on the opposite side so yeah I own more tools but I don't use them <laughs> and a lot of them are a lot of my studio is still in storage in Illinois which is kind of silly because we bought this house in June and I've been working on um making this a basement home studio. Some of you have been around longer, have seen the transformation of this creepy basement to a nice basement studio. Like the addition of this awesome big window. I love that window. Need more plants though. But I have some people who say they'll share some baby plants, so that's cool. So then I'll just soften these lips here. Tidying that up. And then I gotta, I use a stamp rather than, not a stamp, I use a symbol rather than my name on my pottery. It's actually this symbol right here, my tattoo. It's essentially a reminder of seasons. And there's no such thing as true balance. So sometimes, as you saw on the one piece there, I will do it on the bottom. Other times I'll do it on the side, which I think I'll do that for this scenario. more it's still a wee bit sticky so I can do that final cleanup pass another time but I used to have this other tool for signing but it broke so this is what I've been using in the interim oddly it works just fine corner of my loop tool so other times I'll be like a stamp on the piece but other times I'll put it on the bottom I put it different um, one last thing I wanted to show you, um, like I mentioned, this type of foot is great because with that squishing, you have more clay here than out here, and so it tends to want to be like a rocking chair, and so that removes some of the high points there, and if that didn't do it, I use like a piece of drywall screen, and I will just rub it across. And so you can see that it's perfectly flat now. So then just soften these edges. And soften the edges. So 
so there you go. That's your lesson on squash face. So have fun making your own assignments for yourself. And thanks again um, to those of you on Clay Buddies for organizing these workshops for everyone. And like I said, reach out to your with your questions and I can always make another little video. So have a great night. Bye.